Um, I'm going to talk about my dad, and, and he logged around this area, and mostly on the lower end of the island, but he did log farther up the island and on the west coast. And, uh, and he did a lot of other things. Um, but my, my great-grandparents on my dad's side and um, my grandparents, I've got some pictures of, and I don't go back any farther than that. And uh, on the back, there's a picture of their house today in England, both of them. So they're still there, they're stone houses, which are um, row houses. Um, my dad came, my grandfather came out here in 1909. My dad was born in 1907. Um, and they weren't here too long, and my grandfather went to, over back to the old country to serve in the army. And he was wounded in the Somme, and my grandmother got a telegram saying that he was gone. And a month later, she got a telegram saying that they, he's been found in a French hospital. So he survived. And he was shot through the right lung. And when I was a kid, you could see where it went in and where it came out the back. He went to clear a house. He was a corporal and he went to clear a house out and the guy was, he opened the door. The guy was there. So we came back here and um, my ended up with my dad's family. There were seven kids and my dad was second. Anyway, um, they went through school and at when you know, later on, and my dad being a second, and Ernie Gate was the oldest. Um, they went to, uh, being the oldest in the family, uh, when they went into grade six and seven, my grandfather said, boys, you're going to have to go to work because, you know, there was no, they didn't, couldn't support the family. So they went to work, and uh, first of all, they cut, they cut cord with it, and they didn't know how to sharpen a saw. Or they learned from the learned from the Chinese woodcutters how to split wood and how to keep their saws up. Um, some of the jobs that they did were uh, uh, they learned from the Chinese, and uh, then my dad went to work on a on a farm in Duncan, which was uh, Solly's farm. They had, uh, um, they raised chickens and, you know, they, it was a, a multi, multi uh, discipline farm. Uh, another job he had was to cut ties for a railway. And, and that was, they would build a grade and, and they'd have a bunch of fellows cutting ties and they'd throw them up on the grade. And uh, they had to hew two flat sides. And my dad said, you know, it was really tough getting a lot of those ties onto the railway, railway grid. But he said he worked with a black fella that used to pack two at a time. You know. <laughs> um, another, another job he had was um, he cut uh, firewood for, he went went to, into this in the couch and area, cut firewood for a steam yarder. And in those days, it cut about three foot wood. And he was cutting it by hand. I put a circle around it. It's off a book I've got. But that's a painting of it, pretty close to what actually took place. Um, and he, Louis, Louis Miller that he went into the bush with on this particular time, was a good friend of his. Uh, he took a job for another eight cents an hour on the loading. And there was, in those days, they used tongs. And there, were eight, there was a fellow at each end with a set of tongs on the spar tree. And they call it a hay rack. And uh, <coughs> the other fellow's tongs didn't set properly, and they slipped out. 
when his end hit the ground, Louis slipped out and killed him. So for eight cents an hour. Um, another job was uh, after this. It's really hard to put this in sequence because, you know, I wasn't there and it was just hearsay and nothing was written down. But you, my dad would tell me stories. Uh, he fell at Tranquil Inlet, which in those days is up north, west, east of Tofino. Um, and they, uh, they call it concrete. And I wondered for a long time, you know, it's all this concrete. I was probably 50 years old before I figured out it was Tranquil Inlet on the map, you know. Um, and there was uh, two homesteads up there, 160 homes, 60 acre homesteads. Um, one was owned by Darville, and another one was owned by Rose. And there was actually another one that l years later, some of his friends went back and they'd been along with the family and they logged in. But um, uh, that's where he got to know Roy Darville, which will come later. Uh, he fished um, on a purse saner. That was um, one of his other jobs. Nine-man crew because it was all he had was a, a a deck and a powered roller on the back, which helped them pull the net in. So it took a lot of guys, but they made some good sets in those days. They would they sometimes make a set, and they had to let some go. They couldn't couldn't put it all on the boat. The rear deck would be a wash, it would be just the combings and the, and the hatch sticking out. They'd tarp the hatch down and don't take it into fresh water, it sinks. Um, he also, he did one, one year on that, on the, during one season, fishing season on a saner. Uh, another another thing, thing he tried was um, gill netting, and in those days you could rent a gill netter, it was about 20 or 22 feet as near as I can remember, and it had no power, and they'd tow a half a dozen of these out and, and you know, space them along where there was creeks where the fish were running. And, uh, and you anchored both ends, and then you'd pull yourself along and throw the fish in, they'd have a packer come around every day and pick up the fish. Um, and that was, it was orange sail. They had a sail on a little cuddy where you could sleep. And uh, you rented these gill netters by the age of the net that was on it. So the cheapest one was a three-year-old net, or you know, you paid a little more for it too, or a new. So my dad got the cheapest one, you know. He had to fix the net quite often. <laughs> And I can't remember what he said it was. I can't remember what the, the uh, you know, the bill was. Uh, another thing this is to do with fishing on the coast. He worked at the Pilchard plant. I don't know if you know, you've heard of Pilchards. Uh, they, they were like 27. There was 26 Pilchard plants in the West Coast of Vancouver Island, processing plants. Um, they had about 500 people on shore, about 500 in boats, about 75 boats, uh, from small to large. Uh, they would take uh, 50 to 500 tons in a season. Um, there was one boat that made 2,500 tons in a season. and. Uh, for a few years, they were taking about 100,000 tons of pilchards, which we would know today as sardines. But a pilchard would produce about a um, uh, good, good uh, take was about 45 gallons of oil per ton. Um, the uh, oil was used for poultry and uh, cattle feed, or the, uh, the meal was used for poultry and cattle feed, uh, and the oil was used for salad dressing. And white margarine, do you remember white margarine around the war? 
and then nobody liked it, so then they started coloring it. Um, and believe it or not, high grade paint. I never knew that. Um, by this started out about 27 by 46. The pilchard uh, run was just about over, and I don't. They don't know whether they moved farther offshore or whether we fished them out, or it seems like nobody can really say exactly what happened to them. Um, two falls, he traveled to the prairies for threshing, and I don't know whether he traveled on in the train or outside the train, <laughs> because there was a lot. He said there was as many guys non-paying as paying. <laughs> so I don't know where my dad, he never told me whether he traveled outside the train or not. And he may have because he said if you had five bucks in your pockets, it was still there in the morning when you woke up. No thievery, which is, you know, surprising. Uh, another job he had, and I'm not sure how, what extent of that was, but he was, um, worked on David Ginn's grandfather's house. And I don't know whether he framed it or whether he did the whole thing or, but I can remember. And uh, one of David's uncles is named Doug Ginn, that's where I got my name. Um, so uh, in those days after, we, after that, uh, he went into trucking, you know, and he got in being wood, you know, had to deliver it. So his first truck was a, a TT. Yeah. And there's one somewhat like his, but a heck of a lot better shape. Uh, he built a house on North, on East Sanix Road, well, just off East Sanix Road, and I don't know if you know where my Uncle Ern's place used to always have a lot of flowers in front, across from the break-in restaurant or the sidecar restaurant or now it's a clinic, dental clinic. Um, so he built a house up there. My uncle was in the front, you know, on the road, which is now looks like a scrapyard. Have you noticed that? Driving along the East Road near that, um, across from that clinic. It's so uh, Ed sold Ed sold the house. He kept it going for a while as a farm, and then he just gave up. It's too much work, so they sold it. And um, and lucky for us, we got a heck of a big family. But he spread the money around between the family. So which my brother really liked. Um, and there was. My uncle in the front, and my dad had five acres. He had seven and a half. My dad had five acres behind him. John Gate, which is Edna and Joanne's parents, he had a place behind that. That went to Santa Spanish Road. <coughs> Vic Gate, with his family of eight, was behind that. And, and Jenny was beside my Uncle John's. So there was, you know, and I often wonder, how come they're all got the same? It was part of the old um, spots. But, uh, spots had a hundred acres in there, and then when they bought it, it was part of the rows uh, um, property. And my mom worked, did housework for rows. But before I came along, things got really tough, and my dad couldn't make the payments. So we sold it to Charlie Whitten, which is Roy Whitten's dad. And then there was, there was some other Whitten kids. But Charlie Whitten gave my, gave my dad five acres on the Old West Road, free and clear, with a tar paper shack, pole rafters, um, not much, you know, like a, about a 10 foot deep well that went dry all the time. <laughs> and uh, so that, my mom said that's the best thing they ever did was get out of hock. 
you know, there's no payment. She always pictured every car, time a car came up the driveway, she thought, is she coming to collect the money, which she didn't have, you know. So that was, it was really good that he, he arranged that, he was able to. So my dad, when my mom was in the hospital having me, my dad moved us over to the west, the old west road, into this all bush, as you know. <laughs> um, and at that time, uh, he was he was trucking, um, and he he got a job with uh, Allied Lumber, and. Um, you know, the trucks were a lot better than his Model T. He was driving a 510 Ford. Um, and whenever they dumped a load of lumber, I can, I can remember from riding with them, uh, the lumber they cut in those days, it was so long that usually the front wheels came off the ground and, and so you had to put it in reverse and crank it back a bit, get the front wheel in the ground and then give her a joke so it would roll off. Um, and he worked, he hauled out of a, uh, a mill that was at the cor uh, west, northwest corner of Goldstream and Millstream, which is the first little, call it, or little, uh, like, um, what do you call it, um, group of stores. And one of the guys that worked with that, a dispensary in there, optical dispensary. But um, he worked out of that. Yeah. That was where probably, I was about three when he was doing that. And I can remember going in the mill, it had a, an upper and lower, they were circular saws, they weren't bands, upper and lower. And, uh, and the setter, the, the um, sawyer would stop the mill, the setter would say, and I'd ride the carriage with the setter Today, he'd probably go to jail <laughs> for letting the kid ride this carriage because it, you know, moved along pretty good clip. Um, he had, uh, about that time, he bought another truck besides, he, besides driving for Allied, he did other things with another truck and uh, this is his second truck. And this is one that was renovated. And there's a before and after on that. And uh, it's definitely not as bad as the one that before, and it's a heck of a lot worse than the one that was the final renovation. <laughs> they weren't, you know, they were well used. Um, besides that, um, he, uh, we had chickens too. So my dad would buy these boxes of butter and they were beautiful boxes all dovetailed together and waxed. And he'd sell butter and eggs and, my, and dress chicken. And, and I don't know how long he did that, not very long. I think probably about by the, five, by the time of five was over, like he did a lot of, he, you know, he, Worked 12 hours a day sometimes. Before the war, we still had that old truck. 39, right after the war started, we went to Zabalis, where he had been logging earlier with Darvels on these, one of these claims in behind um, Tofino. Uh, he got to know Roy Darvel because they had 160 acres. They took logs off as well as um, as um, uh, the other fellow. And uh, so Roy hired him in the mill. So we rented the place out, went to uh, Zabalis. And that's where I started school. And I might have told you, I don't know if I told you before about me. I went to school about the second day of school. They had cleared the school ground and they piled the stumps up beside the school. And on the corner of the school was a flagpole. And uh, so the, I thought, you know, if I got on the stump pile with that lanyard, 
I could fly around the corner of the school and land on the school steps. <laughs> so I did it, and I guess all the kids are watching, and the teacher figured out what was going on, so she just, when I hit the rail, she just nabbed me. <laughs> and she broke her 18-foot wooden rule on me, Ooh. and then out, out came the big leather strap. My dad never found out about that. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been in, really would be, been in trouble. Well, while in Zabalas, um, oh, one just before that, he started a hull, a 22-foot hull that my grandfather had designed for him, which he's from Newfoundland. He's built quite a few boats out here and up to 120-foot schooners back there. And they fished, they fished the banks. Um, this 22-foot was just the hull when we went to Zabalas. So he sold it to George Polson. I don't know if you remember that, Brian, or uh, Shirley, right next door. Was it? Did it ever get finished? I don't. I don't remember. What year was that? Ah, like he sold it to him in '39. Oh, before your time. My brother was. But that was, you know, that was another thing. Like he always, he worked, was like Ted Bolton, driven. Um, so Ballas had, uh, it, that, the mill was just a, we used a lot of, of wood in, in the mines in, in Zabalas. There was, um, let's see, uh, I think there was, there was one iron mine and they had their own crusher but the gold went out as, as it was blasted. And uh, there was, when we were there, there was, when I was there, I can remember there was only one working. But um, 20, let's see, 35, I think 35 was when they discovered gold up there. And then there was a bit of a gold rush, 36. In six months, there was 3,000 claims staked in the area. Just, you know, it was a bonanza. But, um, uh, so but there was uh, ore they used to haul down, and they put it in sacks like coal. They were small, heavy sacks. And every once in a while, there would be one fall off the truck. Well, they'd pick most of it up. But as kids, we'd walk up the road and... And if you could find a bit of sack around, well, you knew probably there was a bit of gold, a bit of ore there, and there'd be some streaks of gold. And well, we had a, I had a few pieces of it, but when I left home, I don't know what happened to it. I don't think Vern had it, so I don't know what happened to it. Probably my mom threw it out or something. Thought it was just a bunch of rocks that I had saved. Um, so um, that was. Uh, 36, it was, it was coming along pretty good. There were six producing mines in, within two years. By 48, we were gone, but by 48, uh, gold was, was still hung at $35 an ounce, fixed. And so it wasn't practical. And uh, the iron mine worked for a while. We lived on a float house between a general store and, and the post office. And um, my dad, it was, it was a mining town, so there was a lot of miners, and there was two hotels with beer parlors, and so, you know, they'd come down Saturday night, and it was just a zoo. They'd fall over, they'd fall off the end of the dock and drown. And, <laughs> and uh, so my dad says it wasn't a good neighborhood, you know. <laughs> between these two buildings on a float house. So one night with a real high tide, he moved it across the bay, <laughs> get us away. There was, there was one time, this was before I went to school, my mom said she was going to the store, which is, you know, right like where that church is, I don't know. She's going to the store, she said, don't open the door unless you know it's me. And, uh, 
So she'd no sooner left than I heard clunk, clunk, bang, bang, let me in. Uh, so I went and hid under the bed. <laughs> and uh, we had, you went around one corner from the door and another corner, and there was an outhouse, you know, just over the water. Pretty, pretty primitive. We didn't think anything about it. But. Uh, so the guy gave up. He walked down to the first corner, made that, and it, he got, didn't. He got to the second corner, didn't make that corner. I heard a big splash. <laughs> uh, here's, here's another picture of of the ballast. And I'm the little guy with the bag of candy on the right. And the next one is my dad. And the guy with the suit on is the owner. And that was our, that was the mill crew. And they were, there was one fellow in there, and I can't remember which one it was. His name was McShane, anyway. And he had a float house not too far from us. And it was, it was a nice house. And when the water was in, it floated level. But one side of the house was heavier than the other, so he'd put about a four-foot cedar under that side. So when it went aground, you know, the house was on a slope like this. Everything ran off the table. And <laughs> After we came back from Zabal from Zabalis, that was I think about I think about forty-two. It must have been in forty-two. There was uh, one thing. You, you remembered about Zabalis was powdered milk and rain. It rained about 200 inches a year. Um, I've just got written down here things that I remember. Powdered milk came in a big tin, like a big coffee tin today, and it was called Clem. Milk spelled backwards. Um, yeah, we came back about 42. I, and I've got here drunks. It was something I remember being drunk. One thing we did that they would never allow you to do was I would play in the, uh, another kid with and I would would play in the sawdust bin. Today it'd be like playing in a grain bin or something. You'd, you'd never do that. They'd never allow it, but we did those silly, silly things. Um, When he came back, came back from there, um, that uh, George Nicholson, that book, what became standard in the, all the schools. It was about the West Coast. It was a, a history book about the West Coast. George Nicholson was, was, um, he was everything. He was a, you know, mind recorder, justice of peace, marriage, whatever, I, I don't know. There's, in that book, there's a whole bunch of pictures of what he is, signs beside his name. Well, I would go up to see if there's any mail, and I'd say, is there any mail for me today? He says, I don't know, mail, may I'll take a look. He called me May, because I, <laughs> I guess I slurred my word when I said me, you know. <laughs> but, um, so when we came back, uh, then he was he was cutting wood again, uh, uh, doing horse logging, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of horses we had. The, the first one, first one lying down. He was he was a lazy old horse. He was old, and uh, Ted and I could go work with him. We would, the two of us were just kids like we harness him up and walk underneath his belly. He was very trustworthy and, and he only moved when you, when you told him to. Other than that, he'd just stand there or if he got a chance, he'd lie down. <laughs> and then my dad got another horse, which was, you know, a real, a real goer. And he took the harness off the old horse and put it on this new one. Well, He'd replace it all in about the first month, just bust all the harness up. He couldn't keep ba belly bands on him because if he had a hard pull, he'd get his r rear end down and a trace of pull it ba belly band up and smack, you know, bust. So he did, uh, 
He did a lot of that. With horse logging and, par and call pulling power poles, we, I think their uh, telephone pole was five bucks in those days and it was seven bucks for a, for a power pole, which was a little longer. Um, I talked to a guy the other day that he was, he was doing a high tension pull on, on a Wallace Drive near the municipal center. And I said, like, that's a nice pole, you know. I said, what is it, like 45 feet? No, he says 55. And I said, uh, you know, how long do they last? And uh, he says, this here, it turned out, was put in the ground there the year I was born, 35, and it's still there. And he was boring holes in it and checking it and, and pumping some treatment in the butt. But he says some of those will last 100 years which is apparently these um, new, new concrete power poles are turning into a complete disaster. They're, uh, the steel in them is rusting and they're not standing up. So one of the, our granddaughter's um, boyfriend worked for Hydro and he says, I can't remember what he said the figure was. They've got tens of thousands of them and he says, they've all got to be replaced. Um, during the war, we, uh, they hauled hay into the old, where the fairgrounds are now, it used to be the old Logana farm. They hauled hay in there, and they bailed all the hay, all of around the runway, they let it grow and bailed it. And so we were in there during the war, you know, as a kid. And I can remember, there was uh, one fellow was Manny Cooper from the Sartlips, he was a, he had a truck and he was pretty, uh, pretty outspoken. Well, they were coming up the driveway there pretty fast and there was this big heavy fellow and his big Chrysler or something I guess was looking after. And he came down and he said, I don't want any of you guys speeding coming up there because you make a dust and it gets on the berries, you know. So as he's driving away, Manny made some real smart crack and he heard it, so he backs his car up and he said, who said that? Everybody just looked, looked at each other. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, then we, uh, oh, I got some, those guys must have sat back and I don't know what they were using. I don't think, you know, they couldn't do it with a fighter. Maybe they did it with, but there was 50 caliber slugs all through the pot, the hay bales. They'd shoot at the piles of hay. And then I got a chunk of a belt with live ammo in it. You know, they're about that long. And my dad says, when I got home, he says, well, what are you doing with that? Get rid of it. So he didn't tell me where to get rid of it, so I just threw it in our garbage pile. It's probably still there. <laughs> Too dangerous to have around. Poor guy that goes to dig through that with a backhoe. <laughs> um, in those days, there was no garbage collection. You just had, like, we had a rock about that high. We just dumped all our garbage off the back over the rock. Um, he logged on the Wayne, I, one of the places we logged was, um, and I worked with them like during the summers, you know, we were working on uh, Wayne Road and West Saanich, right on the in corner in there where that uh, uh, plant place is there, I think it's still nursery, nursery? yeah. Um, and my dad was paying me $10 a day, I thought, that's a lot of money. So I said to him, I said one time, I said, can you pay me $10 a day? Well, at the end of the day, he said, we'll tally it up and we'll see what we made. He used to do his own scale. He'd scale it and then Dick and Frank would pay him. He was working for Dick and Frank. They would pay him for his scale. They never, never argued about the scale. Well, if he scaled a load that went out, when they went to the mill, they'd say, what was, what was Bob's scale? Okay, that's good enough for us. And uh, they would take my dad's scale. 
Um, so I said, can you pay me? And, and he ended up, he said it was 44 bucks we made that day. So he said, I think I can pay you 10 bucks. And I got a new yellow t-shirt. And I took the shirt off because it was getting hot and I put it on a stump. Woodrow Wilson driving the cat. And he went by the stump and he must have, you know, the old traction shakes a little bit. And I just tamped my new yellow sheesh t-shirt right into the top of the stump and I pulled it off and it looked like a Venetian blind. <laughs> I'll never forget that, my new t-shirt. Um, another place that we we logged, or I would say I worked with my dad logging, you know, whenever I was able to, was uh, West Swans on Brooklyn, <coughs> Old West Road. And he logged that I think they took about, uh, God, I can't remember what it was, just about 9,000 bucks for the logs off it. And then West paid a hundred an acre for 64 acres there. And then he subdivided all the perimeter off and we bought, you know, I bought a lot, an acre and a half lot off him. And my dad signed for me at household finance. And I, uh, the payments were 19 bucks a month, and I got 18 for my paper route, so I had to make extra money to make up the shortfall. And um, that was one uh, one other place. Uh, then we went to uh, Rocky Point, and I was working there with with uh, my dad. And there was a fellow, like Dick was, he had a haze, a gas haze, and. Uh, with two bunks on, and uh, and there was another fellow that was trucking there was Brooks, and I don't know if you ever run across that guy in your in your trucking days, Brooks. He had a Ford cab over, and he'd gone down the states and brought a set of tandems and put on a single axle, so he had a tandem cab over, and he he used motors like. He'd, uh, he was, just drove it. And we were right out on D&D &D property, and it was just like a park. There was hardly under, any underbrush. It was beautiful. And uh, you could hear Brooks coming, or and when we had a load, you could hear him going up up Mary's Hill past uh, that little inlet in there where there's some trailers and fishing camps. It was about five miles away. One day, he's flying down the road. There was a they call it family fuel mill in there. Some guy pulled out of the mill and Brooks hit him. So he got it going. Uh, he had it towed in and took out his front axle. And a day and a half later, he came back and we were sitting down to lunch. And, and I can just, you know, you, you could hear him coming a mile away with two straight stacks up the back. And we, um, and, and Dick, he was, wasn't too fussy about loading me he says I gotta have two loads this afternoon and that was a normal was two loads a day so anyway Dick Dick got him loaded and and uh, but Brooks was a little bit crazy um, that was about the time he bought his third truck <coughs> that's a, the only picture I have this Two-ton chef. Um, and we uh, another pl another place was um, Sunnymead, the east portion of Sunnymead, which belonged to uh, Old McMorrin, which would be uh, I can't remember what his name was. The old the old dad. Anyway, he had that property. They they logged that selective, so I mean, you left anything that was under a foot or more on the stump. And uh, and later on, our second boy worked working with um, uh, Mike, his partner, for Duncan. Duncan Coghill said, "This is not. This is quite a few years later. They took 63 logging truck loads out of that place." after they had logged it, you know, 30 years before. So 
amazing. It comes back, but selective logging, but they actually pretty well cleared that. Uh, Broadmead, they, there was two partners that, that surveyed that and made an offer on Broadmead of a million board feet, million feet of logs. And um, they took a million and a half off. They only paid for a million stumpage. So there was a 500,000 bonus. Um, there was a big burn they were working on. Uh, Dick was working for Ken Marson, I think. I think Ken Marson owned a property. You might even remember that, Susan, with, I don't know. It was, and they had the big burn at, it started at Malty Lake and it went right through up towards the dump um, and they burn, and it burned off. A lot of it had been logged and, uh, but what was remained was, what remained was burned off and the forester came along and said, okay, all you guys are fighting fire. Well, I was a kid, like I was just a kid. They paid me like 75 cents an hour. <laughs> and there was other kids and they were packing water, but I ended up, they cleared a trail and, um, and, and I was just put in charge of about 500 feet of trail to keep it from burning across the trail. And, um, and I was just, I was like on edge, I'll tell you. So Woodrow Wilson had a piece next to me and Woodrow, he'd just take a shovel and make it work like a bulldozer blade. And so he came down and he shoveled out all the you know, the humus that would burn in the soil on my piece of trail. So then that was one day and you, you could hear the odd time you'd get a crown, nothing scarier. Like, and it's over there, it might be like a couple blocks away, but it would just go through, it all just go up like torches. And uh, so then we went back the next morning and this here had a jump the barrier some fellows that were looking after another piece of trail uh, had gone to sleep and they awoke to the toe of the forester's boot. And then uh, it was going towards, uh, uh, what the heck was the name of that? Can't remember. Anyway, this other fellow had a big patch of, like north of a bunch of timber, north of that. And he took all his equipment up there and sat on a line, cleared a road, cleared a road on the line. Um, if I could think of his name, you'd probably remember, you'd know him too, Dick. So, uh, yeah, there's, uh, that's, a, that's about the extent of my, you know, working with my dad. And I never got over, I, you always had a, you were always interested in wood. And so uh, there's a picture of my dad's, actually first chainsaw, his first power saw was a drag saw, which is the, the proverbial drag saw was a wee McGregor, you know, by name. But they were, they were all terrible things, they were a two cycle, and if you flip the wheel, sometimes they'd run backwards. And they used a hot shot battery for ignition and a, a Model T coil for power. You had to take it home every night, put it on top of the oven, make sure it was dry. And now there's a couple of pictures here. This is a colonist took of my dad when we were working in Broadway. Those are just like prints. So I always, I always was interested in milling and, and we were working in Broadmead. I say, you know, because I was just there brushing out, brushing out the base of trees for my dad to get near it. Or I would measure and they didn't have, you didn't have a 50 foot tape on your belt. In those days you had a measuring stick, so. I'd have to limit and measure, and measure it off. And, and uh, so I always was interested. So about uh, 30 years ago, I went down and went to Portland and bought a 
portable mill, which I still have at my summer place. I don't know if I, did I show you that one with my dad and Ernie when we were babies, when they were small? I don't know if I showed you that one or not. And my grandfather's on the other side in uniform. And there's another one of the four generation. Don, my oldest boy, which just turned 50. And, and, my, and I, my grandfather, and my dad. Peter gave me a picture of, uh, or a history in, of the mill at uh, Sydney. And apparently they cut, I think it was 80 feet. BC Force cut 52. Later years, BC Force downgraded to 32. Um, the first saw, we were actually, I was working with my dad in the summer behind George McCarthy's. I don't know if you know, across from Alan Young's place there, George McCarthy up in the back, which is a road up now. You can go up behind Butler's Pit and go up a road up there. Um, and we were cutting wood in there. And I don't know, the, the Chinese woodcutters must have been through there cutting wood for the old VNS or something. Because there was, soon as, when they got to, you know, where it was reducing the size and getting a lot of knots, they just cut another tree down, and easier splitting. And they, when they were splitting wood, they would use maybe three steel wedges, and they'd have a whole sack full of wooden ones with rings around the top. And they would just fill the whole end of the, of the, the four foot length with wedges and they'd just go around bang the whole thing and fall apart. They knew how to do it. And in 57, uh, again, my dad was working with Dick. And uh, I don't know what he did. He made a mistake somewhere. But they found him under a tree. Yeah. So he was killed in 57 in the watershed. I always thought when we went up there, I went up with the coroner and the police and Woodrow. And, um, and they, there was a pry under the, under the tree. And somehow or other, Woodrow pried the tree up, pulled my dad out. Wood was a big fella. You know, he was take his shirt off, he looked like, you know, a bear. But Woodrow pulled him out. The cop from, from uh, Colwood was about six foot three, and him and Wood couldn't move it. So it must have been adrenaline. You know, he never came out of the bush, so Wood went looking for him and found him. Here's a picture of Ernie. Ernie's the oldest one. He lived to 98 years old. And uh, he'd always have his tractor in the Sydney parade. But yet, oh, there's another thing that's interesting. My dad used to buy a piece of property and, and buy it for the wood. And, uh, and he bought a piece of property on Bear Hill Road, 14 acres. I think there's a house there now. And that, there's quite a hill up to that house. We went to Mr. Butler's. We used to have to get, he was taking some logs out of there. Dick was again involved there, Dick and Frank. Um, he was taking some logs out, but he really, he bought it for, it had never been touched. Being right by the VNS, never been touched, which is surprising. Um, so he, uh, uh, there was a wet spot, and they couldn't get the truck in there. So my dad went to Butler's and I went with him. And, uh, and he's told Mr. We went and picked up Mr. Butler and they just had a drag line then and an old yarder to load your truck came up, tripped it on a, on a spillway and it spilled into your truck. So uh, he said, two yards. So I said, two? Why well, you always take three on that? Oh, he said, it won't go up that hill. Oh yeah, it'll go up the hill. So my dad says, three. So, but he says, now when he's got it on, he says, if we don't go up the hill, you've got to shovel it off. Well, it didn't go up the hill. 
So I had to shovel it. He just peed it down the hill and I shoveled the yard off so he could go over the top. <laughs> Didn't have enough power, the old 216 Chevy, you know. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Well, lots of times it was 12 hours. He would like work for Dick and Frank for eight, and then he'd go, during the war, he'd haul for all the farmers, haul hay or do whatever. And he went into Turgeson's one time. We only had so you, gas was rationed, tires were rationed. And he would, went into Turgeson's for tires, and the guy says, he looks at his rating, he says, you can buy anything I got here. My dad said, yeah, if I could afford it. But he couldn't couldn't drive his car much because there was no gas for the car. <laughs> he got, if he ran out of gas, he'd just give him another book. But it was, you know, he never went overseas, so he, I guess, was part of the effort, you know, with service of farmers. When you were uh, living in Zabawas, was there a road in there then, or did you have to win on the Yeah, we, no road, no. Road was a long time after. It was either by plane. Uh, there was a guy called. Well, we called it the Ginger Coop. The guy was redheaded, and I think his plane was called the Ginger Coop. I never. I don't know about that. It was red. I know. It was red. He was redheaded. It was a red plane. You either had to fly in, or you had to take the McQuinn or the Nora. And uh, and the boat was every ten days. So fresh milk soon went. You were on powdered milk or canned milk, you know. And there was a farm at CPC, and he used to come up. He had a, a little farm. He'd come up with a fish boat, and it'd all be full of vegetables. Holy, the town just about shut down. His boat was soon empty. You know, get fresh vegetables was a big deal. Can you connect the years of Dallas? Prospect Lake school years that you attended, and then what happened after that? Uh, I went to Prospect, yeah. And I went from the Ballast to Prospect. I must, I must have gone, started grade two, and must have been grade two. Do you, me do you remember Dick, uh, Dick and Monica Fraser? At, at, uh, Prospect. I can remember <clears throat> Dick and I got in trouble once. So uh, the teacher gave us about two or three pages to remember, like a poetry or whatever, you know? <laughs> you know, Dick, Dick, he just read it over a couple of times, just read, spilled it all off to her. So I was telling my next door neighbor in Piers Island, Laird Jones, which was, he was, you know, boom foreman and mill foreman at BC Force. And I said, you know, the, this, he was really smart. And his sister was the same way. Dick was quite reserved, but Monica, like, it, don't mess with me, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so I told uh, Laird about this. And when I said the name, he said, oh, for God's sakes, that's my wife's cousin's. She speaks five languages, works for the UN, and he's a brain surgeon in New York. <laughs> what am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you, Richard. You know, I went and worked in a lab and put an apron on. You became a professor. <laughs> Uh, we went. We went from there to. Uh, it used to be eight when we started out there. Remember that? And then, and then they changed that, so it was only to six. And we went for seven and eight at Mount Newton. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It probably was. Yeah, two rooms. Yeah. Do you remember stoking the furnace? Do you remember packing wood into the basement? They'd come and deliver slab wood and dump it out in the. And we had to, 
Well, maybe I got a lot of that because of penalties. <laughs> And I used to be able to draw in those days, and Jack Quentin was really good at drawing. And he was really good at caricatures, you know, drawing comedies or whatever. I wasn't any good at that. And I never got any better. Like, Jack and I would get a job <coughs> at drawing, drawing something in the, in the office. Well, that was great. But Jack progressed, but I never, <laughs> I still can't draw now. All I can draw is squares. <laughs> Anyway, thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. This is something off the side. But in the old days they used to the old days they used to use um, springboards because they use springboard because uh well, there was a swell in the butt, but mostly because of pitch in the butt of the trees. So I've got a, this is, this actually shows springboard being used, but it's a little, uh, it's an American, American deal. This is a 150, uh, 300 foot redwood, and they couldn't fall it without hitting a road or smashing it up. So they went up 150 feet on another tree and cut 150 feet off the top. Um, but they do, like they do, undercuts a little different there. They just got a little bit to slide off and they cut a square cut. Uh, my dad's first saw, uh, he wrecked it because uh, you know, it got tamped into the ground, got in front of a tree when it shouldn't have been there.